turn, if you will, in your Bibles to those readings we had from 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 6. Now we're having a brief series in Solomon. We know that many are coming and going at this time, so we've broken off from our series in 2 Corinthians and John because I think there are very important passages there that we're about to uh, look at, and so I thought it would be good to wait until we are all back after the summer break. Now we're not going to look at uh, chapter 4, uh, we looked at chapter 3 last time, we're going to leave out chapter 4, which really gives us a lot of detail about the greatness of the kingdom under Solomon. The kingdom of Israel was the greatest, at its greatest, during the time of Solomon. It's, it extended from the border with Egypt all the way up in the north to the river Euphrates. There are similarities between Solomon, Solomon's kingdom and Christ's kingdom. We know that Solomon had great wisdom, but in Christ, we are told, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The highest wisdom we can ever attain to is that which we find in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the gospel and in the word of God. Here are the treasures of wisdom that are found in Christ. Uh, Solomon's kingdom was ruled justly, it was ruled righteously, and it was safe and secure. And it gave great joy to the people. We read that in chapter 4. And we are told in the New Testament that Christ's kingdom is in all things ordered and secure. It's a kingdom that will never fail those who are members of it, those who become partakers of the kingdom of Christ and are in the kingdom of Christ. And it's one of righteousness, joy and peace. Wonderful thing, isn't it, that as believers we have a righteousness before God. Uh, we know this joy in the Lord, this real joy which the world cannot give because we know this relationship with God and our sins are forgiven and we have this great peace because we know that ultimately whatever happens in our lives, that peace which is the most important peace has been secured for us, that peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Solomon's kingdom flourished, the population flourished and so with the Lord Jesus. Again, there's a similarity there because we know that people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation are being gathered into the kingdom of Christ. The population, if you like, of his kingdom is also flourishing, as in this day so many thousands are coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ from all over the world. But the key thing is this, really the key thing in the comparison between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Solomon, really the outward glory of Solomon uh, pictures the great spiritual, the greater spiritual glory that is seen in the kingdom of Christ. The key thing is this, who gave Israel all these blessings? Who did they come through to the people? Well, they came from God through Solomon to the people. And that's the key thing, you see. So with Christ, all the blessings that we have, they come from God, but they come to us through Christ. And they come to us as the people of God through Christ. That's the great comparison. God blessed Solomon. Solomon was able to bless the people. God has blessed Christ. And through Christ we are blessed in him. And so we have these wonderful things in Christ. This eternal acceptance with God. This forgiveness of all our sins. We're indwelt by the Spirit. We've been made alive spiritually. The world can't understand why it is that we have the desires and concerns that we do. It's because we've been made alive spiritually unto God. And we know him and we love him and we love the Lord Jesus Christ. They can't understand us. Why it is that we're so uh, preoccupied, as it were, with these things. Or why we're so convinced of these things. It's because God has worked in our hearts and made us what we are. We have this fellowship with the Father and with the Son by the Holy Spirit. And we know that if we are Christ, should everything be taken from us in this world, we'd still be rich in, in all that we have because we have all these eternal, certain spiritual blessings in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I were to ask you what is the greatest achievement of Solomon's reign, you might say, well, perhaps it was the kingdom. The fact the kingdom was so great and so glorious under Solomon. Or perhaps it was his wisdom, the fact that he displayed such wisdom. Well, do you know, I believe, and I think the scriptures make it quite clear, the greatest achievement of Solomon's reign was his building of the temple. The fact that he was enabled under God to build the temple. The place where God would actually dwell on earth and where God would show his glory. This is one of the most important objects in the Old Testament. And there is much in 1 Kings and Chronicles which is solely devoted to the preparations and the eventual building and the eventual occupation of the temple by God. It's very important 
in the revelation that God has given to us. And so our title this morning, we're going to look at the temple. Our title is this, God's Temple. God's Temple. We've got four points. We're going to see firstly the structure of the temple as we have it revealed to us here in 1 Kings at the time of Solomon. Secondly, the purpose of the temple. Thirdly, God's other temples. This is not the only temple that God has had or has. And then fourthly, no temple. No temple. Firstly, the structure of the temple. Now we know that God gave to Moses the plans to build the tabernacle. You remember the tabernacle was that tent of meeting, as it were, that the children of God, as they went through the wilderness, uh, God travelled with them and he would come and he would inhabit the tabernacle, uh, which was erected in the middle of the camp. And there God would come down and uh, there the priests were able to make offerings and uh, people were able to bring their sacrifices at that time. The tabernacle represents the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It actually shows us the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And the temple again, as God gave Moses the plans for the tabernacle, so God gave to David the plans for the temple. It wasn't left up to men to imagine what God wanted and how it was that God was to be worshipped or approached. This is very clear if we were to look at uh, 1 Chronicles 28. We read there in verses 11 and 12, Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat, and the plans for all that he had by the Spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord, of all the chambers all around of the treasuries of the house of God and of the treasuries of the dedicated things. Solomon was to follow the plan that David had been given by God, by the Spirit of God. How could it have been any other way, really? God, you see, has never left it to man to work out a way whereby he can be approached or he can be worshipped. It, it has always been that God has revealed these things to men. God has shown men how it is that he can be approached and worshipped. You see, that's where many go wrong today. They feel, well, we can come up with some way in which God, we feel, should be approached or how God should accept us. And they think, well, we'll, some, we'll do something to somehow sort of try and get in touch with God. And they forget that there's only one way that we can truly come to God and worship God. And it's through the way that God has made clear and has revealed to us in his word. People want to sort of add all sorts of embellishments to the worship of God. Things God has never wanted, God has never required. The Israelites did this, didn't they? They added golden calves to the worship of God and God judged them for it because he wasn't happy that they were embellishing the worship of God. And so, you know, people can think, well, we can make our minds up as to what we can add to the worship of God and how God should accept us. God has given all we need to know as to how we can be put right with him, how we can approach him, how we can worship him. He's given it all to us. It's revealed in his word and by the gospel. And you know, there's only ever one way whereby we can come to God. There has only ever been one way. And it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And you see the temple emphasizes this and it brings together all that God had taught the Jews and others about how he could be approached and it brings together all the teaching of God concerning the Lord Jesus Christ as it was revealed to the people of God at that time and it brings together again the truth that there's only one way that we can come to God and again it's all pointing towards the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, all who lived before Christ look forward to his work. All who live after Christ look back to his work. And that was the great plan of the temple, to reveal all the more the glory of God and the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're given a lot of details. If we were to look through 1 Kings chapter 6 through to verse 8 and other parts of Scripture, there's a lot of detail about all the various parts of the temple. I'll leave you to read that when you're at home. I'm not going to go through it all 
now. But just to say, outside the temple was this massive altar of bronze for the many sacrifices that had to be made as you came to God. Well, we know that Christ is the only true sacrifice for sin. There was this great bronze laver, a great bronze basin full of water so that things could be washed. There could be a ceremonial washing. Remember at the cross, the centurion pierces Christ's side. We see the blood and the water flowing. In the Old Testament, it was by blood that atoned and by water that cleansed that people were put right by their sins. There you see Christ, he's the true atonement. The blood and the water flow from his side that cleanses us from our sins. So the temple is pointing to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the altar and in the laver. Uh, the building was about 90 feet long, about 30 feet wide, 45 feet high. It was divided into three main sections. It had these pillars, Jason and Boaz, representing the strength of the covenant of God with his people. Inside there were the lampstands that illuminated the most holy place, the inner section where God would meet, where God dwelt. Showing it's from God that we get all true spiritual light and understanding. Christ says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. There was there in the inner most uh, section, although it was obviously fenced off, it wasn't the most inner section. It was veiled. It was, uh, it was a veil between that and the innermost holy of holies. But in the, in the holy place, not the most holy, of course, there was the table of showbread, where the bread was laid out. Christ said, I am the bread of life. There was also the altar of incense, which symbolized prayer. Wonderfully, our great high priest is ever interceding for us, isn't he? There before the throne of God, the walls and the ceilings were lined with boards of cedar covered with cherubim and palm trees and flowers. They were plated with gold, covered in gold. You went through from the holy place through a veil, into the most holy place, the innermost place where God dwelt. And here, of course, was the Ark of the Covenant. Great cherubim stretched out over that Ark, over the mercy seat, to show the very presence of God. The same cherubim who guarded the way into Eden, guarded the way into the very presence of God. There is God in his presence, in his full presence there, over the mercy seat. And there was the law of God, there in the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, and the priest would come in on the Day of Atonement. He'd sprinkle it with the blood of atonement to show that the law had been satisfied. So Christ, he by his shed blood satisfies the offended law of God. He frees us from our guilt and from our sin, and he brings us unto God. No expense was spared. The materials David and Solomon collected and used, they were the best could be, Hiram, a wonderful worker in metal, used his skills to decorate the temple. And we can only imagine its beauty. Every article and part teaches us something about God, something about Christ, and how it is the one way in which we can be reconciled to God. It's all pointing forward to the great work of Christ. When the temple was built, we're told in chapter 6, we read it there, there was complete silence all the stone was cut miles away and brought, and it was all done in silence, showing that God is a God of peace, who makes peace with sinners and makes his enemies to be at peace with him. This, along with the fact that David would not have been, been allowed to build the temple, emphasises the fact David a man of war, Solomon more a man of peace. So a brief survey there of the structure of the temple. As I say, you can go home and you can uh, seek to read more about it there in uh, 1 Kings in those chapters, the structure of the temple. But secondly, the purpose of the temple. We've already talked about this in some ways, the purpose of the temple. Now, many of the scriptures concerning David's reign and Solomon's are all concerned with the building of the temple, as we said. And clearly, it's a very important thing in the purposes of God and in the history of Israel and in the history of the world. This temple was built before the Parthenon in Athens and any of the major buildings that the Romans built. And it does seem that the temple became well known. We can show the temple became well known throughout the known world. And its form and its structure was in fact copied by the Greeks and the Romans. 
You see, in the Old Testament, God is revealing himself more and more. So the whole world is gradually, step by step, not only the Jews, but the whole world is learning more and more of his great purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ and his great plan of redemption, his great work of redemption that God does. He's the God of the Jews, yet he's the God of the whole earth. So the whole earth, though people weren't sent out as they are in the New Testament to spread the gospel still, the news of what God was doing through Israel, we know, was going out still into the earth and people were learning of it. We know that the whole earth learned of God's power in the way he brought Moses and the people out of Egypt. We read of that, the... uh, Harlot, Rahab, she confesses, we know of what you did, of what God did. When he brought you out and divided the Red Sea, she says, we know, the nations round about knew. They learned of these great works of God. And Solomon says, and behold, in 1 Kings 5, behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build a house for my name. A house for my name, God's name. God's nature, God's character and glory and his great purposes would be seen through the temple. There would be those who would come up to Jerusalem, they'd see the temple, they'd learn of God and they'd be impressed with the beauty and the wonder and they would go back and tell others. We'll see this tonight. That was the experience of the Queen of Sheba. She was but one of many who came up to Jerusalem and to the temple and saw the great glory of what was there and then went back and we believe she told others of what she had seen but the key thing really is this with the temple 1 kings 8 verses 12 and 13 then solomon spoke the lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud i have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you for you to dwell in forever a place for you to dwell in forever you see here was God coming and dwelling amongst his people there in the temple what a thing we know God is present everywhere but here he came to them in a greater way and he dwelt amongst his people and because of his presence his people are known as the people of God and the city is known as the city of God because of his presence there in the temple of God. The temple was the place, you see, where God dwelt in a special way. And he showed his nature and his purposes to the world as he dwelt there at the temple. And as people came up and they saw the glory of it, as we say, we believe many other civilizations afterwards copied it because they were so impressed with it. And they learnt of the ways and the works of God through what was shown to them there at the temple. It's amazing, Solomon's amazed that this great God, the maker of heaven and earth, should use him to set up a place where God would be amongst men and women on the earth. So the great purpose of the temple was to reveal God to the nations and the purposes of God in Christ, but also it was an amazing thing that here was the very place where God would dwell. God would dwell amongst his people. But what about, thirdly, God's other temples? God's other temples. We thought about the temple there with Solomon, how great it was, what God was seeking to show and to uh, reveal to the people and to the world through dwelling in that temple. Thirdly, what about God's other temples? Well, we know that Solomon's temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. A second temple was built under Ezra and then a more elaborate one was built by Herod. This was completely destroyed in AD 70 by the Romans. And there's never been another temple since. God has done away with the physical temple. God has done away once and for all with the physical temple. But has God had other temples? And are there temples of God today? There's no physical temples, but are there temples of God today? Well, he still had another temple when he dwelt on earth. 
In John 2, verses 19 to 21, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. You see, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, is the fulfillment of the temple. Because in Christ, God took a human body, he took a dwelling place, and he occupied it here on earth. Just as with Solomon's temple, so God dwelt among men and women here on earth. If you like, Christ and his body are the fulfillment of the temple. When God tabernacled amongst us, as it were, was present amongst us in the person of Jesus Christ. But you see, the Son of God, he leaves the world and he goes up to heaven. So where is the temple of God now? Well, we don't need to look too far because Paul speaks to those believers in Corinth and he says to them there in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, he says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Amazing, isn't it? That church there in Corinth. And the scriptures show us that each faithful, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church, which is made up of true Christians, though it's small, though it's looked upon so often by the world as foolish, Paul says it is the temple of God. It is now the place where God dwells by his spirit. You see, some believers, they look, or some people, they go back to the Old Testament when they think about the dwelling place of God. They think, well, here is some church building, or here is some great cathedral. Often we find in that cathedral that sadly the gospel isn't preached. There's all sorts of unbiblical practices and strange rituals that take place. And they think, well, that's where God dwells. They feel, well, you know, we've got a great sense of God's presence there. When we went into that cathedral, I think it's really just a great sense of a cavernous space. Because it's not the place, really, where God dwells. It's clearly not the place. The scriptures make it clear to us. God now dwells in the local church, in the fellowship of the saints. They are the temple of God. It's not the building. It's not this building which is now the temple. Some can go too far with that and make too much of the building. It's very difficult for a church when they are meeting in a community centre, really. You think it can't be the building that is the holy thing, that is the temple of God. It's not the building, you see. It's now the people. The people are the temple. They are the spiritual stones. They are the dwelling place of God. The fellowship of the saints is the dwelling place of God. He dwells amongst and with his people. So Peter says, you also, the believers he writes to, as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's not the bricks and mortar here that is the dwelling place of God. It's the people. It's the fellowship of the saints. We're the living stones amongst whom God dwells. Just as the temple showed the glory of God and declared the purposes of God, so we too as members of our churches are to do the same, our life together, our worship, the way that we care for each other, help each other, admonish each other, our evangelism, our praying, the preaching of the word, all are to give glory to God and to show the nature of the God who dwells amongst us. God is present with us amongst his people and we're to show forth his glory just as the Old Testament temple showed forth the glory of God and of Christ. Some can look on the church, even the local church, as a very human thing. They look upon it as just sort of like a club or their friends. Well, hopefully we have got our friends here, but it's sort of, sort of a bit like the sort of cricket club or the rugby club. It is not. It's not just a sort of association of friends who've just got a sort of mere sort of common interest. We have got a common interest. It's the most important interest. It's the most wonderful uh, interest there can be in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we've got to see that it's, 
the dwelling place of God. God is there with his people. It's there to glorify God. It's there that others might learn of the God who is amongst us and with us by our testimony and by our witness as the people of God. It's an incredible thing, isn't it? Incredible thing to think that the God of heaven and earth, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, chooses to come and dwell with us. When we think of what we are by nature, and many of us have very little in the eyes of men, but God dwells with us. God is with his people. We may not have much by way of this world's riches, but we are very rich, very blessed to have God in our churches and amongst his people. Do you see this? Do you see this yourself? Do you look upon the church in a very human way? Well, my friends are there, yes. But I hope, you know, you have got friends in the church, yes. But do you see it more than that? Do you see it as being a precious place to you? A precious place to you because you know that God is there. You know that God dwells there. You know the people of God, the people who are his dwell there. Is that your experience? The church of God, it has a high esteem in your thoughts, in your heart. Because you know it's where God dwells, you know it's where the people of God dwell. And you realise that you should be those who identify with it and support it and encourage it with all your heart that it might all the more be strengthened and used for the glory of God. Alas, some people don't see this, you see. They don't see the glory of the local church, the fact that this is now the temple of God. It's where God dwells. They don't see it. They can be like spiritual nomads. They drift from one place to another. They don't put down roots anywhere. They just drift around. They don't see the glory of the local church. When Paul wrote his letters, if he wrote to... At Corinth, he expected that he could write to all the Christians there in Corinth because he expected them to be in a local church. We should be joined to a local church. If we see its glory, if we have the eye of faith to see the glory of, church, of, of the local church, this is the temple of God now, this is the place where God dwells, we'll be joined to it. And we want to support it with all our being. Often with older, older Christians who can't get out, and we know that uh, that's been exacerbated of late, but you find when you do visit them or when you talk to them, the first question they have is, how are things going with the church? How are God's people? That's where their heart is. They appreciate the glory. But God doesn't only dwell in the temple of the local church. We read another amazing thing, stunning thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. Paul says to individual believers... He says there, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Amazing. All that this God has done, the God who dwelt in the temple, the God who dwells amongst his people, this God, all he's done. In Christ I can be pardoned, I can be forgiven, cleansed, accepted. More than that, he makes me his child. I'm adopted by God. He makes me an heir of God, joint heir with Christ. And yet the amazing thing is, if that weren't enough, he actually comes to us. He indwells my heart. I become a temple of the living God. That's why a believer knows this intimacy with God, the presence of God. They know a reality in prayer. They know what it is to turn to God at times of need and cry, Father, Father, help me. Because the Lord is with them, you see, in their hearts. They've got this intimacy. Is that your experience? You know this is so because you yourself enjoy that fellowship with the Father who dwells in your hearts. You're able to look to him day by day. Your desire above all things is to please him and serve him. You want that fellowship with him. You find you can't go long until you're concerned to have that fellowship with God once more by his word and by prayer. Because you see the Lord is with you, he dwells with you. An amazing thing that God takes possession of us and makes us his own. He dwells in our hearts. And just as the temple was to glorify God and enable others to learn of God, so we all the more desire that others might learn of God through us. And so we seek to glorify God. We seek to avoid that which casts 
scorn, as it were, upon his name, that which would seem inconsistent with the name of God and the glory of God and the person of God. We seek to walk righteously and we seek to overcome the world and we seek to please God and to grow in grace and to overcome sins and to be all the more made like the Lord Jesus Christ. God is dwelling in us. We're a temple of God and all the more we realise we must show forth the glory of God. Well, finally, fourthly, no temple. No temple. Now we read these amazing words in Revelation 21. Revelation 21. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I saw John, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven as a guide, as a as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And later on, John says, But I saw no temple. I saw no temple. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. At the end, once Christ comes and this world is brought to an end it's being judged God's people are brought into heaven there is no temple there why is that because God dwells fully with his people there in heaven there'll be no place where he's not fully present God will dwell with his people his people will dwell in God and we will fully experience in his presence his fullness of joy what a realm of joy, what a realm of love that is. That's where God is leading us to. That's where we're going, dear friends. We're going to be in the very presence of God, in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Us, fully in the presence of God. What a thing that will be. We're going to be changed. We thank God we're going to be changed before we get there. We'll be made like the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing, isn't it? God wants us for himself. He's given us his son. He wants us so he can bring us fully into his presence. And if you like, he can possess us fully there in heaven. What an amazing thing. He's possessed us now by his spirit. We have the guarantee. We have the insurance, as it were, of all that is yet to be. Shouldn't we want to please this God? Shouldn't we want to glorify him who has given us this wonderful destiny, this wonderful certainty? Do you desire him and his presence all the more? In your heart, because of all that he's done for you, are you willing to turn from those things that grieve him? Those television programs, those things on the media, whatever it is, you're willing to turn from them, to cut them off? Because you desire him, you want him first and foremost in his presence. What a day it will be, that last day, for those to see the people of God going into the very presence of God there in heaven, but others being shut out. What a terrible thing it will be for them. May none of us be found on that day as those who do not know God and so therefore are not able to enter into that wondrous presence with God. May the Lord work in our hearts today. May we seek God with all our hearts today. May we know what it is to have come to God and to know his forgiveness and his salvation before that day that we ourselves might be those who know him now and know his love and know his mercy. It's there. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we must seek him until we know it. He's willing to give it to us. May it be our experience. He's willing to save us if we will but humble ourselves and call upon him. May we know him now. And so therefore, may we be those who are prepared and ready for that time when we can enter into his very presence and into the abundant joy of the Lord. May it be all our experience May we know this God, may we marvel as the people of God, that the one who is very God of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, dwells in our hearts. He's with us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, dwell in our hearts. What an amazing thing. May we be those who therefore all the more are fit temples of the living God, all the more seeking to be pure and holy before him. May God bless us before that great day when we forever enter into his presence. And may he glorify his name through us. For his name's sake we pray. Amen.